Hello and welcome to the Power Tools for Coalitions webinar series. I'm Danae Hartfield, Senior Coalitions Relations Coordinator at USDC, and I'm so glad to welcome you to today's session. The Power Tools series is organized as part of USBC's training, technical assistance, and capacity building support for the network of state, territorial, tribal, and community breastfeeding coalitions across the United States. This series occurs on the odd numbered months from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Access to these webinars is free and open to all breastfeeding coalition leaders, members, breastfeeding advocates, and to anyone involved in forming or leading nonprofit organizations in the breastfeeding field. Webinar announcement emails are sent through USBC's coalition's announcement list. If you're not subscribed to this announcement list, we invite you to visit the Coalition's Learning Connection located in the USBC website where you can subscribe to this forum to receive key updates and announcements from USBC headquarters. A USBC login is required to join the Learning Connection, but it only takes a minute to create, so we do encourage you to do that. As you know, we've streamlined access to this series, so you only need to register once to have access to all future sessions. Once you've registered, you'll receive reminders from the GoToWebinar system with your unique link to join each session. Slides and handouts for today's session can be found on the Power Tools webpage and has also been chatted to you. We do understand that not everyone can make it to our live session, so we do record all of our webinars. And you'll be able to find the recording of today's session on the web page or in the Coalition's Learning Connection along with our other archived sessions. And here's how to navigate to the public web page. Simply hover your mouse over the Coalition's tab and select either the Coalition's Learning Connection, which is the second option here on the drop down menu, or you can select the Power Tools web page, which is the fourth option from the bottom. For today's session, all participants are in listen-only mode, but we encourage you to type in your questions all throughout today's session, and we'll be sure to uh, read them to our presenters during our 30 minutes of Q&A. And here's how you do it. Um, go to the GoToWebinar panel on the right of your screen. If you don't see it, it may be minimized. Uh, just click on the orange tab, and it should pop back out. If you scroll down below the audio section, you'll be able to see a tab for questions. And when you click on it, you should be able to type in your questions in the box. If you have any webinar-related problems, please be sure to send an email to coalitions at usbreastfeeding.org, and one of our staff mem members will assist you. And that brings us to today's topic, Fundraising 201, how to maximize the impact of your next campaign. National Breastfeeding Month is right around the corner, so it's the perfect time to start thinking about your next campaign. Last year, the USBC team shared our basic tips and tricks for holiday fundraising, and now we're back with even more campaign ideas, tactics, and tools for raising money and supporters for your coalition. Today, we'll discuss USBC's campaign planning philosophy, different donate functions, how to leverage a free gift and double your donations through corporate matching. We'll also share several campaign content resources, including state-level action alerts and extensive photo galleries. You'll leave ready to plan and execute a campaign of any shape, size, or style for your coalition. And that brings us to our presenters today. I'm thrilled to introduce the USBC team to you today. First, Lynette Enigbo, our USBC PR and Communication Coordinator. Uh, she attended Indiana University for both her undergraduate degree and graduate degree. She has experience managing social media, graphic design, marketing, and advocacy. Lynette currently writes our monthly Coalition Spotlight newsletter, uh, publishes the weekly Wednesday Wire, manages our social media content, and plays an active role on the campaign planning team. Sarah Lebedovich has been working with the United States Breastfeeding Committee since 2009 and holds a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Cheryl is currently our workplace consolation steward and works on our fundraising campaigns. 
she also, uh, she recently completed an analysis of the intersection of state and federal workplace breastfeeding law in collaboration with federal and state agencies and many of the breastfeeding coalitions here. Uh, she serves on the campaign planning team, as I mentioned before, and supports the publishing of USBC's uh, e-newsletter, Weekly Wednesday Wire. Uh, Megan Renner, our USBC Executive Director, has been working with the United States Breastfeeding Committee since 2004. She previously served as Executive Director of the Institute of Management Consultants USA and the Museum Trustee Association and as Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of Lamaze International. Megan holds a bachelor's degree in government and international studies from the University of Notre Dame, as well as a nonprofit executive certificate from the university's Mendoza College of Business. And finally, Sarah Walt, our program and campaign coordinator, graduated from Carleton College with a bachelor's in English literature. While in school, she actively pursued coursework in activities related to women's health, gender issues, and reproductive justice. Sarah currently works on our advocacy and fundraising campaigns, builds our website content, and assists with conference and event planning. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sarah. And Sarah, you may be muted. Thanks, Janae, um, and thank you for those wonderful introductions. As Janae said, I'm Sarah Wolf, and on behalf of the campaign team, we are so excited to be with you all today. Um, before we dive into our new content, I want to take a little time to review what we discussed on our first fundraising Power Tools webinar back in November. Um, we have been affectionately calling it Fundraising 101 or uh, our, I think our formal title was Fast and Furious Fundraising Ideas for the Holidays. Um, so because this webinar took place right at the cusp of holiday campaigning, some of the resources were tailored toward holiday campaigns. Uh, but the general fundraising information completely applies to all campaigns, no matter the time of year. And the materials could definitely be tweaked to use outside of the holidays. Uh, since this was almost exactly eight months ago, in fact, like almost to the day. Uh, I'll do a quick rundown of the topics. Uh, at the get-go, we went over the legal background of accepting individual donations, um, including how to do so with any 501c3 status, whether that's positive status, uh, pending, or and also without 501c3 status. Um, we included important legal language uh, that you should include when communicating with your donors. Uh, we spoke about how to collect donations if you don't have a donation, an online donation page and alternative software you can use for that. We also talked about one of the biggest days of the year for nonprofits, Giving Tuesday, right around Black Friday, and how you can capitalize on all the momentum around that for your coalition. Uh, we talked about savvy shopping tools your supporters can use to give back to you while they're shopping online. We shared tips and tricks for asking your network for donations, including the all important, just ask them. Uh, we shared a really great USDC resource, which is our foundation's directory online subscription, uh, which gives our coalitions access to a wealth of information on community and local foundations. Um, in that vein, we shared a template letter of inquiry that you can send to local foundations about your work. Uh, we discussed how to drum up interest in your campaigns, including matching challenges with your board and volunteers and making social media memes, which Lynette demoed live for us on the webinar, which I loved and was very, very cool. Um, finally, we talked about post donation and post campaign follow up, how to turn your thank yous and acknowledgements into more engagement and how to extend fundraising beyond a single campaign. And I've included a link here to access in the Power Tools archives, as Janae mentioned earlier. I've included a link here to access our slides, our recording, and our handouts, which included a lot of really awesome resources from November. Um, and as you can tell, it was a jam-packed hour and a half. Uh, and we are very, very excited to be back with even more topics to discuss and resources to share. And so with that, I will turn it over to Cheryl to get us started. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, like she said, we're so happy to keep building on all that we discussed together during the Campaign Planning 101 webinar with several more tools and considerations to put into your metaphorical toolbox. 
Um, and to start, we're going to talk about some campaign planning philosophy and strategy. So um, as you likely know, hosting a campaign, it can take a lot of time and effort. It can take a lot of creativity, but it's also a really powerful way to accomplish your coalition's goals. So as you're considering a campaign strategy, there are a few key items that you'll want to consider in order to maximize the impact of your efforts. Luckily, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and Pyramid Communications have created this really helpful tool called the five M's of strategic communications. And it's a great tool to kind of guide you through your campaign planning process. And as you're thinking about these big ideas that you have for an event or for a blog series or whatever it is that um, you want to, to do for your coalition, this is a really it kind of walks you through all of of the questions that you'll want to consider um, when you're making decisions through that process. So we'll start out by just walking through this tool together. And the very first M is for mighty goal and objectives. So you'll want to write down exactly what you hope to accomplish through your campaign. And you're going to want to be specific. So whether you hope to raise awareness about the issue very broadly or you want to educate a very specific audience about a specific topic, um, maybe you want to make sure employers know about um, how they can provide workplace support or to let healthcare providers know how they can support families in your state. Um, you might hope to pass a bill or build relationships with policymakers or raise money. Um, or you might have a mix of all of these objectives that are really woven together into one big campaign. You'll probably notice that usually when the USBC hosts a campaign, there are many different threads that we are weaving together. So we're trying to, um, we might have some sort of education component and a fundraising component, and we're tying all of these together. Um, so once you come over, come up with what your mighty goal and objectives, really what is it that you want to see in your state? What are the changes that you want to inspire? Um, you want to think about how are you going to measure success? What does success look like? So you're going to want to outline the specific ways that you're going to evaluate your progress and what your goals are. So for this, it's really important to be re realistic. All of us want to raise breastfeeding rates. All of us want to ensure that every single family has the support that they need when, where, and how they need it. But uh, that's probably not a very realistic goal for um, a single campaign. However, you can certainly track the number of engaged partners that participate, or how many constituents contact policymakers about a bill, or how many views a blog or an article or a Facebook post has, or you might want to raise a certain amount of money for a project. Um, whatever it is, you want to make sure that, that the, um, the, the evaluation criteria you have that they really match these SMART goals. So they're specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're realistic, and they're time bound. Uh, the next M is for market. So once you've decided on your campaign objectives, you'll need to figure out who do you need to engage to meet these goals. You're likely going to have several different target audiences. I think this is a really unique thing about being a coalition is that you have um, folks from all different sectors and all different walks of life and you're trying to figure out how to make a campaign that sort of connects to all your entire audience. So, um, you know, it's okay to have all these different audiences and it's really helpful to write that out and think through um, what is the specific ask for each of these groups? And who is it in within that audience? Who has the strongest influence or who's the key decision makers who can help you achieve your goals and objectives? And most importantly, of course, you're going to want to think about who's affected by this work and what do they need to know? How can they contribute to this and how can we ensure that we're really meeting the needs of families? Next slide, please. So the next M is messages. Here you're gonna to wanna to think through the three primary messages that you need to communicate 
to each audience. So you're going to want to identify the specific action you want them to take and make sure that this ask is front and center. It's really easy to open up with a lot of background about a topic, but you need to make sure that when an individual closes that email or they hang up the phone, that they're going to remember exactly what you want from them. It's gonna be clear, it has to be compelling and feeling urgent, um, and it has to be memorable. The WK Kellogg Foundation, in addition to this, um, the 5Ms resource, they have this really great resource, it's called the First Food Message Guide. And it outlines the key messages that will lead to a cultural shift in which breastfeeding becomes the norm. These messages work to support discussions that really focus on systems of support for breastfeeding rather than individual decisions. And it includes sections that are focused specifically on different audiences and different areas of support. So there's a certain section for employers and another for healthcare providers. And this is a really great starting point when you're thinking through the messages that you want to consider for your campaign. So linked here, you're going to see that you can go to the March 2015 Power Tools webinar and get a whole 90 minutes um, right from the Kellogg Foundation about this resource. Uh, next up is Messenger. So you want to think about who is the best person or organization to communicate your message. And this is going to vary for each audience. A policymaker might be most influenced by a business owner in their state, whereas families might be most receptive to messages that come from friends or family, provi uh, family members or healthcare providers. Um, you really want to take the time to consider who has credibility with the audiences you want to reach and what do they need in order to be inspired to and prepared to share that message. Uh, later on, you're going to hear from Lynette about providing sample tweets and other strategies um, to your influencers so that you can spread your message even further and really hit the audiences that you're trying to. Next slide, please. The final M is for medium. So what are the best ways to reach and engage your audience? Is it through an in-person event, through social media, on an upcoming meeting, through email? Um, as a coalition, again, your network includes many different stakeholders and each of these are likely gonna require a very specific message delivered through a very specific platform. So you might be reaching out to individual supporters through your Facebook page to ask them to donate and contact legislators. And at the same time, you'll be sending emails through listservs that are inviting organizations onto a sign-on letter or calling media partners to ask them to cover your issue in the local press. Whatever it is that you've decided to take on for this campaign, you want to think about um, what is the best platform to get this message to the people that it most needs to reach. Um, you're going to really want to try to think about what are the communica communication channels that you have access to and think through how each of them can help you reach your goals. I know that when we've done this with the USBC, we've discovered that we have dozens upon dozens of communication channels and it can feel a little bit overwhelming, but when you see them listed out, it really guides you through, oh, okay, so we need to send this through this channel and this through that channel. And it, it, it just helps you to see it written out in this way, um, which is one of the things I really value most about this tool. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to bring up is that as you're thinking about a campaign, if you are feeling short on ideas, the time feels right, but you're not exactly sure what you want to do, um, don't be afraid to find inspiration from other organizations. The USBC campaign team subscribes to email lists from tons of different organizations and across all different um, sectors and all different types of um, different issues and different types of organizations. And we look to those to kind of find inspiration about what's possible and to find examples as we're figuring out how might we implement this thing. Um, I mean, if something sticks out to you, there's a really good chance that it's going to stick out for someone else as well. So I even, one of the little tricks that I have is I even keep in my Outlook, I keep a folder that's called um, Campaign Ideas. And I throw in their email text examples that I really like and I want to remember and refer back to, things like that. Um, you know, there there is 
really a lot to be said for pulling from our colleagues and pulling from other organizations to get ideas about what might be possible in our own work and for our own coalitions. So next slide, please. So now that we've considered your campaign strategy and some of your communication strategies, I wanted to launch into some of the specific fundraising ideas that you can use to raise money for your coalition. So we're going to start out by talking about thank you gifts for donors. This is something like a fundraising campaign in which a free magnet or a tote bag or whatever is mailed to every donor that gives above a certain threshold. This incentive can inspire new donors to give or encourage donors to stretch their contribution in order to meet that minimum uh, that is required for the free gift. Uh, to decide if this is right for your coalition, you're going to want to consider how much the item will cost, the shipping expenses, and the amount of time and money it will take to design, organize, and mail that item to donors. Um, even a small item, it can, it can be a little bit labor intensive to get the thing to look how you want it, make sure to ship it to you, there could be setup costs, you're going to want to consider all of these different factors. Um, there are tons of companies that sell all kinds of little tchotchkes and everything that you can order for a small price, but you want to look at how many are you going to sell. Um, you know, you don't want to have a stock of 9,000 of a product in your house or in your office. Um, of course, small flat items are going to be easier to store and cheaper to ship, but the, the really important thing when you're choosing a free gift is that it should be something that's going to help further your work. So for example, your gift can help provide exposure to your logo or to a hashtag or a tagline. It can help raise awareness, it can serve, or it can even just serve as a symbol of solidarity. Many of you probably received in your inbox today uh, an email blast from the USBC with a new button that we're offering with donations. And this is a great way um, to kind of inspire folks to feel connected and feel like they're part of something. Um, so you need to make sure that you're kind of finding a sweet spot within all of this with a gift that it's affordable, it's manageable, and it supports your work. And promote this, when you promote this offer to your network, don't be afraid to let your donors know why you chose this gift and how it can keep on giving. Because the research is actually pretty clear that it's important to talk about the gifts you offer as a way of advancing your mission. Next slide, please. Another creative donation strategy that you can consider is asking your supporters to become monthly donors. So with monthly giving, it's a small commitment can really ha offer significant support for your organization. I mean, $10 a month isn't very much, but it equals $120 a year. And for many of us, that's actually considered one of your higher level donors. Um, you want to let your donors know that recurring donations give your cause a steady stream of support and that's going to help you make sure you have a stronger budget and you're have um, more efficient with your work and your fundraising efforts so that their donation is going that much further. With online donation software, this is really especially easy because they can just sign up for a recurring donation. But you can also encourage people to consider um, mailing in a check or whatever your strategies are. Um, if you don't have online donation software, I again, um, encourage you to go back and look at our uh, Fundraising 101 webinar that Sarah shared about. Um, and you can even consider launching a campaign or a, um, that's entirely focused on recurring donation um, or have just a dedicated online donation page that's just about monthly giving and center all of your message on why this is so great for your work. Network for Good um, has all kinds of information about recurring donations, but I especially wanted to lift up this quick start guide for nonprofits. Um, encourage you to look it over. It really kind of walks you through step by step what you'll want to consider. Next slide, please. Another really good way to inspire donations is with tribute donations. So many people appreciate the opportunity to give in honor of or in memory of someone who valued the mission of your organization. I know that this is something that I've done for friends and family members or even colleagues to just kind of honor who they are and what how they approach the world. 
Um, this often shows up with alternative giving or virtual giving. So this is a form of gift giving where the donor, instead of buying a gift for the recipient, they make a donation to a charitable organization in the recipient's name. Um, messaging around alternative giving is, can be especially effective around gift giving holidays. So like Mother's Day, um, or the year-end holiday season. And we always like to say that just like breastfeeding, it's green. There's no shipping, packing material, or wrapping paper needed. So um, you'll see even if you've made a donation to the USBC, donors who make a tribute donation um, receive the link to a certificate that they can then download or print and they can share it with the recipient to acknowledge their gift. Um, and you can even see some sample messaging right on the slide here. So with that, I'm going to hand it over back to Sarah, who's going to share with us about corporate matching. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about corporate matching, which is one of the easiest, uh, low effort ways to increase the impact of someone's gift to your organization. Uh, many employers have programs to which they will match charitable contributions by their employees, which can even double or triple your donation. For example, if an employer does three to one matching and your supporter gives $25, that turns into an instant $100 donation, just like that, or in a little bit of time after they process through their HR department. But uh, you just need some simple language with your organization's information that lets your supporters know that they should look into this, whether or not their employer could match their gifts to you. Um, and I've included a link here to our matching gift page. I didn't post it in the slide because it's a ton of text. Um, it's not exciting, uh, but so I've included the link to our matching gift page. So feel free to take this language and slot in uh, your organization's name and information. It's got some basic little instructions about contact your HR department and see what the steps are to finding out how uh, employment matching works. Uh, the next step after setting up a page with instructions and information about your matching gift program is to promote it. Um, there are some really great ways that you can play on the word match in an email. Uh, when I was brainstorming for this webinar, I started thinking about match points and like maybe we could have done something around Wimbledon and tennis. That one didn't fully come out, uh, but like matching and online dating, um, or as Cheryl said, we she mostly mine everything that comes into our inboxes. And something that came into mind that caught my eye had a pair of um, like mismatched socks, like a laundry day situation, and the caption was something like, "Are you my match? Are you our match?" Um, so yeah, that stuck in my head, and I looked, and I really liked it. Even the picture I used on this slide of these incredibly adorable children in matching dresses. Uh, plays with the word matching. Uh, so there's a lot of fun language that you can do around a really simple email with that. Um, you should also include a link to your page on matching gifts, uh, a link to your page on matching gifts that's on your individual contribution page. Uh, that's where you'll be hitting people that are already donating to you to sort of get that spark started to see if they maybe have that sort of program with their employer. Uh, and finally, I suggest I would suggest reaching out to your volunteer network and your board or your organizational leaders. Uh, they're already involved in your organization. They already know how amazing you are, and they are possibly already donating to you. Uh, so this is a good chance to remind them that their gifts could possibly go even further than they're already going. Next, I'm going to talk about state-level action alerts. Uh, so the USBC often has national individual actions where supporters use their tools to write to their representatives and senators on the federal level. Um, this software is also available to our coalitions for state level alerts. Um, we have done ones for jury duty laws, for paid leave, anything related to breastfeeding. Um, and so if you have an action or a bill coming up that you want people to support and to start contacting their legislators about, please let us know. Um, it's a really easy way to drum up support. Um, everyone, especially in this latest year, everyone really loves to contact their representatives and senators. Um, it's a super easy way to drum up support, yeah. And in terms of fundraising, it's a great way to show people why they should donate to you. You're the ones out there advocating for the moms and babies of your state. Um, and it's simple enough to just tack on and ask for donations with your action alert. And on this slide, I've included some sample language 
um, you could include this in a couple places. You could include it in your email asking where you do ask people to take action. Uh, and, but also the place I would suggest is in the email where you thank people once they've taken your action and written to their legislators. Uh, simply slot in your organization's name in the all caps here. Um, and a little bit about the action that they just took. Um, this is a really great time to ask someone for donations. You're in the midst of demonstrating what it is that makes your organization so great. You're in the midst of demonstrating what it is that you can actually do for the, for the families in your state. And they're already feeling involved with your movement if they're taking your action. So it's just a step further to getting them to make a contribution to you. Um, so I will now pass it over to Lynette who is going to talk about some other tools and resources available and how they can be used in campaigns. Okay. Hey. Hello. Let me put mine on presenter mode. Um, so yes, we are, oh, oops. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the photo gallery, support stories, as well as sample tweeting. So first I just want to say that both the photo gallery and the support stories are great ways to give a boost to your emails and social media posts. Um, especially on social media, images go a long way, as we talked about in the um, Twitter, I think Twitter 101 and 102s, um, it just, they, on Facebook, Twitter and especially on Instagram, you have to have a picture to post at all on it on Instagram, but all of it takes up more space and gets your tweet more attention. Um, so we're going to start by looking at um, the support stories link and I've linked it clearly for you so that you can come back and um, find the links easily here, but we're going to go to the support stories link and um, so if you go in here, you can see the different topics that we have. We have sectioned out for you the priority stories. And you can, when, when you click the submit your story button and scroll down, you're able to actually see other people's stories. And as you can see, we do have it sectioned by um, location. So if you go through and think there are some stories that you would want to use, um, for your campaigns, you can email. Um, you can email office at US Breastfeeding and we will actually we can gather the support stories by state and by topic for you and send you a very nice neat email and also we we will make sure that the peop that the stories that you're getting have been clear to be used um, so that we have so the person who shared their story also gave us permission to use their story widely. Um, so those can be added to give your emails an extra boost. Um, we often use them for graphics along with pictures from the photo gallery um, to help you um, show support and um, give voice to women who are in that are currently needing breastfeeding support. So this is just sort of a great way to bring other people's voices into the work that you're doing and allow people to speak for themselves. It's especially great when we are um, considering sponsors, um, potential funders for our organizations, um, because I think funders is also, these are stories that appeal to them. Um, and the uh, it's a way to allow, like I said, people who are in the situation to have their voice and have their voice be used and have their voice be heard. So it's not just something coming from your organization. You're not just saying that women in Pennsylvania want this. You can have stories from a woman in Pennsylvania, from women in Pennsylvania, from, Pennsyl from families in Pennsylvania um, that support your claim about the need for services or the need for support or the need for um, attention on the issue you're trying to shine light on. Um, so as I said, go ahead and send an email to office um, letting us know what, what stories and what um, topic and what states you want stories for and we would be happy to compile those for you. We also have a photo gallery um, as the images that have been that are used throughout this um, presentation are from our photo gallery and I decided to cut and paste the approved uses because as you can see it's actually a really wide range of uses 
Um, so really the only it's non-commercial, right? Or commercial uses, um, non-commercial uses are almost completely covered under our terms of use for the gallery. So it is a gold mine of images for you to use to consistently spread your message um, and to get make sure that your message is getting attention um, on social media, through emails, but as you can see, it can also be used for presentations um, to policymakers. It can be used for reports to funders, research and scientific purposes. Um, so again, this is one of my favorite resources, especially um, because I do the social media and sometimes it, it really just gives you a boost and it, it really, it, the, the metrics show that it makes a difference um, and they and that's why they do it. And it should also be noted that um, on on Twitter, for example, if you use an image and the and the and the post is getting more attention, say more likes or more retweets, it actually increases the size of the text. Um, so when someone's scrolling through your feed, the text that's along with that picture will also begin to expand as it gets more attention. So it's it's a like a, a snowball effect of of attention that photo that adding a photo can help your um, tweet get. So we're going to head out and take a look at the gallery. So when you head over to the gallery, um, you a US breastfeeding forward slash photo project. So it's pretty easy to remember. It goes through the terms of use. And it's very clear about prohibited uses. Um, and then when you hit agree, then it'll take you to five different albums and it has a description uh so i'm sorry so each of these has different albums so there are a few different places you can have images from florida from utah from indiana california north carolina so i think sometimes it's easy to stop here but there are a lot of other albums that you can scroll through to get a a, a range of images and a range of people in those images. So it is a very diverse set of images. There are images of um, milk banks. There are um, entire families, so photographs with fathers. So I encourage you to go through and look. I What I like to do is I like to pull out images that I'm intending to use. Um, so here are some that you can see. I like to keep folders, not on my desktop anymore because it just gets way too crazy but I like to keep um, folders of images that stand out to me from the photo gallery uh, because there are so many. And so I encourage you to maybe pick one or two and pull out the images that you like so that you have them ready to use. Okay, and so we gotta get back to the sample tweets. So, Sample tweets are a huge deal for campaigns. Um, sam sample, sample tweets make it a lot easier for supporters to spread your message. So if any of you, um, even if you're someone that's pretty good with Twitter, chances are sometimes you get to the to the part to the um, part where you actually write your tweet and it just can feel like writer's block. You only have 108 characters. What's the best way to use it? Is it on message? And that's another thing, right? So I um, making Writing sample tweets lets the people that support you know that you're okay with what they're saying. So, so there isn't any worry about if this is crossing a line that maybe they don't know or they don't mean to cross or if it actually goes along with what you're saying. It takes away all of that worry for the people who want to support your message. So I highly encourage you to always write some sample tweets. Um, and I know there's always the question of how many, kind of like with Twitter, how many tweets in a day? With sample tweets, I would say um, five to eight. So one thing you want to consider is that um, you can't tweet the same tweet within 24 hours. So I like five to eight because that means anybody's um, tweeting um, or scheduling tweets can tweet your tweets more than once a day for a week or two weeks. And, you know, as we've talked about, the lifespan of a tweet is only 20 minutes. So once in the morning, once in the evening actually gets you really good coverage. And it just maximizes the amount that a supporter is able to tweet um, your message. So some tweets, some tips for writing. I found that strong informative statements um, go over the best. 
So social media especially tends to move really fast, Twitter even faster. So something that someone can say, yes, I agree and like, or, oh, I really agree and I want everyone to know, to retweet, you know? And so that's why strong informative statements really are the best um, sample tweets. And you also want to maybe try to have two out of three, you, um, hashtag, link, or a mention. And this here, this app with our name, US Breastfeeding, is a mention. So when, when this is tweeted out, we'll get notified that someone tweeted to us. So I, I wrote out um, a tweet that is informative and strong, and someone can say, yes. So I support National Breastfeeding Month. Um, 2017 and U.S. breastfeeding because the decision to breastfeed to be, should be celebrated in our culture and supported by our policies. So this is a strong statement that you can put on Twitter and I'm going to cut and paste it and actually show you how you can use this in um, your emails to get the most out of not only the tweet itself, but sort of getting direction to your social media pages, growing your Twitter following. Um, so sample tweets can be added to emails in two ways. Um, and, I, and I actually recommend doing both. So you can add the raw text. I've added another sample tweet. This is very, very strong. So it's kind of alludes to the Gates Foundation promoting breastfeeding internationally. And then, and then says, which funders will fill the gaps and insert state abbreviation. Um, with the hashtag National Breastfeeding Month. So you could tweet this out and ask people, you know, who who do you, like, what funders? Do you know a corporate matching place? Um, do you know a restaurant that has, has a grant? Is there a coffee shop that's looking to get in, to start donating? Are there individuals? Um, it's kind of a great, great way to start using social media to crowdsource information. Um, maybe there are some funders online that you can tweet to and say, hey, is this something you might be interested in and have some information prepared about breastfeeding gaps in your state? Um, but um, so yeah, I, I highly encourage using the, the, sample, the raw text of the sample tweet so that, so that someone like me or um, anyone wanting to support your message could cut and paste this message and tweet it or schedule it. Another way that you could do, do another thing that you can do, and I encourage you to do it, is to link the tweet from Twitter. Um, so at the end of this, you could put tweet it now and then link it. And I'm going to show you how you would go about linking a tweet from Twitter. So if we head into Twitter, um, so I'm already signed in. Um, so if you head into Twitter, there are a few ways that you could write tweets. Um, I'm gonna do it on this here because it's the most immediate way. So you'll come up to your homepage and I'm going to, oh, just kidding. So I'm gonna put it back on my clipboard because I took it off. Um, so I'm gonna cut and paste it. So as you, so if you are looking here, it says that I'm negative one, if you see, so it's not gonna let me tweet it. But what's actually happened is that I, I hit space. And so my, my marker was just one over and it counts, spaces count. So if I move this marker over, I'm all of a sudden negative one. So you wanna make sure, don't automatically, if it's really close, don't automatically think, oh man, I gotta, where am I gonna find one space to delete? Um, so just go ahead and move that back. So I'm going to tweet this right now so you can see. And if you are on a device, um, please feel free to go and like or retweet this tweet. <laughs> um, so now that I see it tweeted, I'm going to hit this drop down menu that says more. And I'm going to hit copy link to tweet. So you see it copied here. I'm gonna hit copy. Um, I'll do it where you can see it. Side hit, copy. Um, and so now what I'm gonna do is go to my go to meeting. Let's see, where is it? Oh, I drew this down here. I'm gonna put it, nope. I wanna send this. Oh, 
Can someone help me um, send this to everyone, this link? If I could send this link to everyone and you'll be able to see um, that clicking this link is gonna take us to that tweet directly. So you can embed this in the text of your email. And, and then people can actually retweet and like the tweet that you've already tweeted. Um, so now that that's happened and we can see that it's getting likes, it's getting retweets, which is really great because it's directing people to our page um, and it, it's gathering a, so that now anyone can, can, can copy the link to this tweet and say, look how many people retweeted this. Um, and so that'd be a nice thing if you're, if you're, if you would like to link something to a funder, it would be really great to do it this way because then they can see and keep track of just how many likes and retweets it got. Um, so if I go to my notifications on the top page, since it had our name in it, I'm going to be able to also see all of the people that retweeted it, right? So now I can say, okay. Um, and this is a great way to help me figure out who's engaging um, with the content that I'm putting out there. So hopefully um, this is helpful in terms of the best way to utilize Twitter, or not the best way, but, but upping your ability to utilize Twitter, making every tweet go just a little bit further. And actually, I'm going to have to say I'm really excited <laughs> about how many likes and retweets this is getting. This is by far my favorite. Um, feature of Twitter. Um, and also it makes it so, you know, suppose that you have, a, I can't, I'm, I'm really into, into social media, so I feel like I'm just, I'm going crazy now. But um, another thing that's nice about copying the link right away is that you see now that it's lost in my social media, like it's lost on my own thread. And so it's nice so that it, people can get directly to that tweet. You don't have to worry about getting it, about it getting lost. Um, but I, I just want to do a quick thing before I go so that just in case. Um, now, this is helpful if you don't have other things. Like right now, we have something pinned, and I want to keep that pinned. But I could pin this tweet. Um, so using the link also allows you to keep attention on specific things or it allows you to not lose a link. So suppose I want to pin this tweet that I tweeted three minutes ago for till the end of the day, but I wanted to repin this tweet later instead of tweeting it again, I could actually save the link and tweet it. And so maybe on another webinar, we'll talk about embedding tweets and how that might be useful. But for emails, I think the, um, the, the copy link for tweets. So hopefully there'll be more of these and we can keep diving into super cool features of social media and um, I can keep sharing some of my favorites with you guys. Um, so let me go back and make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, just kidding. Yep, okay. Yeah, so thank you. Change the presenter to Megan. Great. Hi, everyone. Are we switch switching to me? Yes. Before questions? Okay. Great. Thanks, Lynette. And thanks so much, ladies, for all of the great fundraising ideas and, and content. Um, I'm just queuing up my screen here. Can you see the uh, first slide? Yeah, we can. Okay, I need to flip the display yeah. really quick. Give me one second. So, hi everyone. Um, this is Megan Renner from USBC. Um, and while you are percolating on any questions that you would like to ask um, in the chat box of our team and the different fundraising ideas, and you could also go back and ask questions about um, 
the topics from the previous webinar or you know fundraising questions in general we're happy to do our best to answer answer any of those that you have um, but before we go to Q&A time I'm gonna do the the quick dog and pony show about the National Breastfeeding Month 2017 theme you are hearing it here first um, you're the first first audience that will get this content because the information is has just been launched um, and actually it's very exciting because what you're looking at here um, you might re recognize this image um, from last year's USBC holiday campaign when we sent out our holiday e email card um, we used a similar version of this with the different icons showing all the different um, types of breastfeeding support in action um, and we had um, in the center a holiday message you can see here that we've updated this one and it now is about National Breastfeeding Month um, We've made it generic so that it can apply not just to this year, but to future years. And it is now available um, both in postcard form um, in this uh, landscape orientation where it's longer left to right but also in a portrait orientation poster in a couple of different sizes in our cafe press store so one of the things that we're always hearing every year regardless of what um, advocacy actions are happening regardless of what discussion themes we are um, doing people are always looking for posters for National Breastfeeding Month for, for local events or clinics um, offices um, and so we're really excited to have this and and hope that it can be useful you know again not just for this year but for for um, many Augusts to come so we'll have the link um, shown a little bit later of how you can get get some of these in postcard or poster form um, and it's also in as one of our one of the gals mentioned um, our email blast just went out today also includes the link to that so we are very excited about this year's theme, um, especially in this, this year of transition and a new administration and, and really taking stock um, of the direction and, and all the different actions that have been going on this, this decade with breastfeeding. And so the theme is called Charting the Course Together, and it is focusing especially on how we use data and measurement in the breastfeeding field, but especially, you know, not just thinking about how do we use measurement of breastfeeding rates themselves or of breastfeeding specific um, interventions, but also how we map into and build connections to all of the different other health topics and initiatives that breastfeeding impacts. And we know there are so many of these, right? Um, and especially um, in the, the disease prevention kind space that's very prevalent where we are always talking about oh we want to connect to breast cancer and diabetes and all of these things so we really want to use this measurement topic not just to look about breastfeeding and and look at our own internal work but also focusing on how we connect and, and as a cross-cutting public health issue that is a really high priority because of all of those um, intersecting interwoven influences that breastfeeding has so you can see one of our um, objectives here is going to look at um, both the Healthy People 2020 set of objectives, again, not just the breastfeeding ones, but we're mapping to all of the different topics that have relevance, um, as well as looking at the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative, um, which you may have heard about last year at the USBC August events when the World Breastfeeding Trends team working on the U.S. report um, had their, their first launch of a draft report. We're looking forward to an update this year, including a state-focused uh, report out coming in August. So we'll be able to look at both of those as existing markers that that uh, we can can reference for this topic but also it's time to begin to look ahead and think ahead about Healthy People 2030 and some of you may have been around back you know really it was a decade ago if you can believe that when the first food field mobilized tremendously across the country to inform Healthy People 2020 we had a small team of volunteers in the USBC um, national members that worked on all sorts of action and templates um, to to help advocates go out across the country in both of the sets of public meetings that HHS hosted. Um, so almost 10 years 
months ago now. And right now, this year, you may have seen that Healthy People 2030 is in the really early stages of its development. It's had the, the committee has been formed, the National Advisory Committee, and they've had a couple of public meetings. But they're way up in the clouds right now at the high-level framework space. Um, and so that means that we want to get ready to be thinking ahead so that next year, um, or later this year and next year, as they do go into the details and look at public meetings and look at specifically the different objectives and which of our breastfeeding objectives might be kept, which might be tweaked, making sure we don't lose any critical objectives that we do have, uh, we really want to be ready. And so we're excited that this theme is also going to really set us up for, um, for that discussion as well and advocacy with all of you. So, and of course, overall, the goal of this, the campaign theme is to ensure that breastfeeding is recognized as, as a key issue and incorporated across all of the relevant areas of the public health agenda, something you might be hearing from us a lot, that um, getting, getting onto the public health agenda in all the places and spaces. So, coming very soon to the National Breastfeeding Month webpage, we'll have a discussion guide that will have prompts to spark dialogue and conversation on, there are four different foundation health measures of Healthy People 2020 that we want to focus on. And you'll see that they actually have a lot of relevance. Um, you know, the general health status measure uh, focuses on um, you know, life expectancy, um, health status, you know, activity, uh, chronic disease prevalence, so lots of connections we can make there. Um, and you can see I've even used these little arrows to show that we'll be uh, specifically in the discussion guide emphasizing points where you might make connections um, with, these, with these different measures. The second one is the health-related quality of life and well-being. Um, that one will be uh, great to focus, especially also on the not just the physical, but the mental and, and social aspects, emotional aspects, the bonding, of course, that is so often left out of the conversation when we're always talking about disease, disease prevention with breastfeeding. So that'll be a great place to connect there. Um, determinants of health, of course, has been a, a big topic and will really allow us to talk about the whole ecosystem of breastfeeding, the support all around the families. Um, and also, you know, we think is an opportunity to educate more and inform about the meaning of the um, impacts of breastfeeding, the population level benefits and what that means uh, for the nation versus what that means on the individual family level. Um, and then lastly, the disparities topic, um, of course, is a great tie-in to all of the work on equity, and specifically racial equity in the first food field, applying that lens, looking at where we have good data or where we might be lacking data, and of course, especially tying into Black Breastfeeding Week, which, as we know, is the end of the, of the month, the very last week of August. So look for this discussion guide soon. We hope it will be helpful both to inspire conversation and then also to be supporting the advocacy that we always do and mobilize during the month of August for a policy change. Um, specifically, USBC hosted events. Um, the way we're going to really manifest the theme this year is, is brand new and exciting. We're going to do the first ever vlog carnival. Um, that's vlog with a V. Um, and you may have remembered or experienced blog carnivals with a B, um, as in boy, more um, in the past. I know Moms Rising has done some before um, that we've partnered with. You might have other partners in your state that have done blog carnivals where lots of different individuals and organizations submit blog posts into one big curated, um, you know, theme and, and then it's promoted and shared um, and it's lots of, lots of words and lots of voices coming together around one theme. We wanted to do that, but instead of having it be um, in writing this time, we're going to, work to, to do it with video blogs. And this, this might sound daunting, but um, we, we really hope that it will actually be uh, potentially a simpler way, an easier way for many of our breastfeeding advocates and supporters to engage because it's so easy nowadays just to take, take your phone, um, get together with a couple friends, um, maybe at your coalition meeting and record a little video. Um, doesn't have to be long, just, you know, can be talking about any of the different topics, can be talking about what you are, are doing personally, what your coalition is doing. Um, as a state coalition, you could talk about your state's breastfeeding rates and actions, all sorts of things that, that we could do with these video blogs. So we'll have um, instructions and more information about how to participate in that. And of course, Lynette and the team will be doing um, 
curbside TA, technical assistance at the conference for those who will be there. Um, and we'll have a particular channel where there's a playlist that you can upload to. And of course, we will promote and, and help to share all of the great submissions that we hope to get. So stay tuned for that. We are really excited to in innovate and try out the, the vlog format. And then it will be especially tied into a launch with the new event at the National Breastfeeding Coalition's conference on Saturday evening. We're going to have a, a big open mic and social media mixer event that night. Um, and although um, there will of course be many folks in person with us in DC there, um, you can also join and, and participate in the event virtually just via the hashtag and on the different social media channels we'll be sharing out um, live as well as, you know, sharing different blog recordings that have been submitted, sharing different information from, um, from the event. So we hope you'll join us, whether you'll be physically in D.C. or not. And then uh, for those that will be in D.C. on Monday the 7th is, of course, the Breastfeeding Advocacy Day of Action. We'll be going to the Hill. Um, still, you know, monitoring and looking at what's happening with healthcare reform, so it'll be an interesting time, um, potentially even changing under our feet as we are, are moving. Um, but then again, even if you can't be with us in person, we'll be doing um, support for in-district visits, recess visits um, during the rest of the month. So we know right now um, that the Senate has already decided to extend their time. So they will still be in session during the first week of August when we are there. But then they will eventually go home um, for the rest of the month. And the House right now has not extended, I think, especially because they'd already passed the health reform bill. That doesn't mean that they couldn't decide to extend. There's other business they might want to do, so stay tuned. We'll know more about that um, soon. But, you know, because of that potential delay in the start of the recess, we're going to actually do the in-district visit briefing after the in-person event, so on Thursday the 10th. Uh, we hope you'll join us for that webinar, and of course, it'll be recorded in case you can't be there at that time. Um, we'll post it right after and have all the materials to um, have leave behinds for your congressional offices. So that's our activities. Um, in terms of your activities and events, of course, you know, we know that many, many folks, especially the breastfeeding coalitions, do their own events and activities. And so we always invite you to share those, um, both by uh, posting to the NBM 17 calendar, which is, is now up on the webpage, um, as well as through USBC communications channels. Uh, that link there is the one that can allow you to submit a news blurb that can be um, shared in the newsletter, on social media, all different types of, of options there. And a special coalition-focused action um, because, of course, this data focus is really uh, aligned with the sharing of the annual state breastfeeding rates updated from the National Immunization Survey. We do also want to share a Swiss cheese press release template um, that you could use. You could take that and then it will highlight the theme already so that you have some um, stock language that you could share with local media. Um, and then you can just insert your own information about your state's breastfeeding rates, um, your state's cost savings now that we have some of that state data. Um, and, and also, you know, you can insert any information about your activities that you might want to share um, with your partners, with policymakers, and with the media. So please stay tuned for that as well. We'll send out that template um, to the State Breastfeeding Coalition leaders list that we have. Um, and then lastly, uh, just a reminder of all the other ways to connect. Um, of course, you know, make sure you're signed up for action alerts with your own individual emails, or if your emails changed, you might want to make sure you're still on the list, especially if you didn't get that email blast today, that might be a sign that you need to click this link and, and um, make sure you're connected. Uh, of course, follow our social media accounts, and the hashtag will be NBM17. Um, as in past years. Um, as I mentioned, the posters are available in our Cafe Press store, along with a bunch of other items, um, both new and old, um, that, that you can, can download um, and, and purchase from Cafe Press. And then uh, the new Breastfeeding is Bipartisan button, you can see the image here um, is available with any size donation this summer. And you can also um, get, get given blocks if you want to have you know, a block of 25 for your coalition meeting or so. And if you want to get five and take them to your congressperson visits, um, you know, there's lots of different options with the, the button storefront um, at that link. So 
I think those are the major highlights for me. Um, and of course, you, like I said, you're hearing it first here. We will be sending out more information um, in the coming days, uh, including that discussion guide. And of course, we'll also have some social media graphics, you know, some meme templates. Um, that we'll be posting on the web page as well that make it easy to share about the theme and these different activities with your network. So please stay tuned for that, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions or um, get any ideas that you might have for us. So I think am I turning it back over to you, Danae, for Q&A? Yes, yes ma'am. You can go ahead and turn it All back right. over to me. Great. Okay, and we do have a couple of questions. Um, so our first question is, in your Campaign 101 webinar, uh, you all suggested signing up for Amazon Smile as a simple way for coalitions to support fundraising efforts. Uh, since Amazon is not code compliant, should we be concerned about partnering with the Amazon Smile? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so this is a question that we have been investigating at the USBC with, with different um, different sources of information in, in the last uh, couple of months. And I can report that um, we've had some conversations with uh, Marsha Walker at NABA, and she actually was already activating around this topic. Um, apparently there is a really small change that Amazon could make to their um, promotional display on the website. Um, and so she has a letter that she sent uh, requesting this and just explaining that it would be pretty small but would actually solve the issue. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're basically in a holding pattern. Um, we, I know many coalitions have been using Amazon Smile and hadn't been alerted to this even before we talked about it. We had been using it for a while. We are just in a holding pattern right now of not, pr not promoting it, um, using it at the moment, but hoping for some good news very soon um, from, from that outreach. So as soon as we hear anything um, or know anything about the response to that request, we will, we will let, let you know. Um, you know, I guess on a related note um, with the um, NAPS coalition, the Safe Sleep Coalition that USBC has been partnered with, um, they had been doing some similar attempts at outreach to Amazon, specifically around um, different types of, of sleep products, including that there are still some um, actually, you know, not recommended, if not outright banned <laughs> um, by the AP guidelines products such as crib bumpers and things that Amazon is still selling. Um, and so, you know, a similar type of vein of outreach is, has, has happened over there. And so, you know, again, there could be some, some nice cross-pollination if one track of outreach to Amazon gets a response quicker than the other. Um, you know, so, so we're excited to see what, com what comes of that, um, especially as, as Amazon is growing and growing in, in size. We're definitely see seeing it's, it is was already a behemoth and seems to be becoming more so. So, so that's what we know at the moment. Um, but as soon as we know more, we will we will let you know. Great, thanks so much, Megan. Um, so the next question, um, I believe, is for Sarah. Um, can you provide some examples of where we can find language about corporate matching? Yeah. So. Besides just like our webpage, um, other resources for it are really, honestly, as simple as Googling corporate matching nonprofit. Um, uh, Cheryl pointed out Network for Good. They are an organization that has really, I, I really enjoy their resources. Um, their toolkits are pretty simple and straightforward to follow. You do have to sign up for their emails, but then you just get more inspiration in your inbox for things you want to do for campaigns is what happens to me. Um, so yeah, I would suggest uh, checking them out and also just looking at, looking at other organizations and the way that they structure their language as well. Great, thanks so much. Um, can you provide some examples of organizations that host great campaigns that we should consider following? Um, so I think maybe either Cheryl or Lynette. Sure, this is Cheryl, and there are so many. So some of my favorites are within the USBC network. Moms Rising hosts a lot of really great campaigns. 
Um, National Partnership for Women and Families also has another one. They have a really strong fundraising um, game going for them. And I also like to really look beyond the breastfeeding circle because I think there's a lot of innovation that we can kind of miss if we stay in our little circle. So um, Environment America is one. I love the World Wildlife Federation. Save the Children. I mean, really all three of those do a great job of kind of like with what Lynette was talking about with getting their images front and center and getting those to pay attention. Um, yeah, different organizations like that. I bet Sarah and Lynette probably have others that they can recommend, but um, those are some big ones. Yeah, this is Sarah. I think what Cheryl said, yeah, like our outside of the breastfeeding world tends to skew national because that's where we want to draw inspiration from. So I'd also suggest sort of like looking in your state and seeing what state level organizations are organizing about. Um, other ones that do camp cool campaigns are NAMI, the um, mental health coalition. I really enjoy their stuff. And although it skews very far left, which is not our personal position as an organization, um, Emily's List uh, does some pretty cool visual stuff. And every time their emails come into my inbox, I'm always really excited to see what they do. Cool, thanks so much, ladies. Um, can you provide some examples of, of how our coalition can use Instagram in creative ways for our campaigns and even how to use Instagram stories? I think that's for Lynette. Yeah, yes, I will take that one. Um, Instagram is a great platform to use because Instagram posts very easily to Facebook and Twitter. The integration works even better with Facebook because Facebook um, bought Instagram. So um, sometimes if you, when you have, and this is something to note, when you post something to Instagram and then you post it to Twitter via, via the toggle, the Insta, when it goes to Twitter, it, it just gives them a link to your Instagram, um, to whatever you, to whatever you posted on Instagram versus on Facebook where your complete post with text will show up. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But one thing that I love about Instagram is the stories. Um, so if you have the Instagram app and you open it up, um, if you go to the top left, there's a little camera. And at the bottom, the first thing, it says live, it says normal, it says boomerang, and then I think it's rewind. Um, and then hands free. Um, I will check that. I'm, that. I'm very sure that's how it goes. Yes, that's how it goes. Um, so what you would want to do, you can go live. The thing to consider about live videos is, um, going live is kind of like Periscope. Um, so it, it happens right then and there, the video. Um, I have not gone live in the last two weeks. Maybe something has changed. I don't think that you can save the video. I would not do it like that unless you are, unless you have sent a, unless you have made a post on the body of your Instagram saying that you're gonna go live. Maybe you have a coalition meeting and not everyone can attend, you can make a little graphic that says, hey, we're gonna be going live during this coalition meeting. And that's a really good way to let other people be engaged with what's happening at the meeting without having to show up um, in person or especially if they can't. And the nice thing about that is they can actually comment as the meeting is going on. So just having one person in charge of maybe um, setting it up or keeping it um, on and keeping track of who's saying what is a great way to engage um, supporters doing th during things like coalition or planning meetings. Um, another great thing about using the, if you use the normal setting, you can create these short videos that you can save and you can share on other platforms. And it goes through as a story so that someone who um, is sitting at home and maybe can't make it to the um, to the conference that's happening in August could see the conference through your perspective. And your perspective is very, very important. Um, it's important for the people who can't make it to see that you are there that and that you're engaged. 
it sets you up as it, it, it really positions you as someone who's serious about the field, serious about the work that's being done in the field, interacting with other people in the field and taking the time to make sure that it's um, a diplomatic process. Right. So one thing that social media does a great job of and and using social media, using videos on Instagram, using the text, sharing it across your other platforms. Um, Instagram is definitely the most efficient way to do that. It also lets people know that you that you want them to see what you're doing um, and that you are excited to share it with them. And so this goes a long way also with funders um, so that you so that if a funder decides, you know, let me check out what's going on. You have Instagram pictures you have you have been using your Twitter. You are really establishing yourself at positioning yourself and establishing yourself as that voice. Um, so for just efficiency sake, I would definitely recommend um, using Instagram. Um, so another great thing, so a lot, it can be hard. You might be thinking, oh man, that's another app. And then I'm going through and I'm opening all these different apps. I don't know if I can manage all that. Well, I have great news for you. So if you are, if you've been taking pictures and videos, it only works within the last 24 hours, but you can push just like when you get to Instagram and you open up that little camera app on the top and you get the screen. If you push the screen up, it'll actually show you pictures from your camera roll from the last 24 hours. So if I'm like, for instance, I, prefer, I really like to use this if I'm going to an art gallery. Um, so I just take pictures as I'm going. And then when I leave the gallery, I decide which ones I want. And then I upload all of it at the same time. Right. And so then there also isn't a lag. Um, so sometimes you'll see that maybe someone's watching your story and at five o'clock they leave and then they don't watch it again. Um, so it really keeps people engaged to watch the entire thing from the beginning to the end. Um, another thing that I that I like to do is if you take a picture of a blank wall or sheet of paper or something, you can use Instagram to write on that wall. And now Instagram has enabled you to use hashtags within your story. So you can even hashtag National Breastfeeding Month or um, anything else. So I encourage you to play around with Instagram, play around with saving, making stories in Instagram and saving them, um, making stories on your camera roll and uploading them to Instagram and the other platforms. Um, I think that finding out what really works for you and your knowing what works for you, your personal preference, it really is a matter of personal preference, um, whether you're doing it at Instagram first or on your camera roll first. Um, but I really encourage you to check it out because it, it, it has long-term and short-term benefits and it's worth it. Um, so, and also a thing to consider is all those videos and pictures that you take and maybe you share some, uh, maybe you share 50% of them on Twitter Maybe you share 30% of them on Facebook and maybe you you only share 10% of them on your Instagram feed because Instagram feeds much more curated. You still have all of those, right? So you still have those for emails. You still have those for throwback Thursday posts. Um, so it's worth it. Um, I think that oftentimes when I talk about the lifespan of things on social media, it can be discouraging, but th the content is there. Right. And content is king um, in our in the digital age and being able to create original content takes you much, much further than recycling other people's um, content. Um, so, it, um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, that's, I'll stop there. I could go on forever, but I will stop there. If there are any questions, please let me know or clarifications. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lynette. Um, wow, such a wealth of information. Um, we know that sustainability is such a very um, important topic for our, our breastfeeding coalitions and uh, nonprofits in general. So thank you again, Lynette, Cheryl, Megan, and Sarah for such a terrific breakdown of USBC's campaigning strategies. Um, we don't have any more questions at this time, so that will bring us to um, the end of today's session. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and for everything you do to improve the lives of women, children, and families. Uh, we look forward to having you all at our next webinar session. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.